So good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, this CDDRL uh, seminar with Peter Henry. My name is Frank Fukuyama. I'm the director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, and I'm extremely uh, pleased to be uh, introducing uh, Professor Henry. Uh, actually, this is really welcoming him back. He was a professor uh, of economics and finance at Stanford for many years. I think that uh, he must have left uh, right the same year in 2010. I arrived in July of 2010, and uh, Peter uh, had already gone to be the dean of the Stern School uh, at NYU uh, a little bit earlier that year, so we actually didn't uh, quite overlap. Uh, but he was a charter member of the CDDRL faculty, and it's really terrific to uh, have him uh, speaking here uh, again, he's a very distinguished professor of economics, and uh, I'm really pleased that he's going to be speaking about his recent research on infrastructure. Uh, we started a global uh, infrastructure project with Mike Bennon uh, in this past year at CDDRL. I'll just tell you this one anecdote. Um, you know, the development community has been really focused on issues like uh, public health, governance, anti-corruption, women's empowerment uh, in recent years. Um, and that's a big shift because they used to do uh, infrastructure much more than they did places like the World Bank or USAID. And I was struck, uh, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, uh, the, what's now the King Center on Global Development here at Stanford had a, uh, a conference on uh, global health and I was chairing one of the panels and there was a representative of an NGO in Africa called Riders for Health that delivered vaccines on motorcycles. And at the end of the panel, uh, I asked, well, so actually what is it that in order to do your job uh, better, what is it that you actually need? And the representative of this NGO said, well, you know, it'd be nice to have a little bit of electricity and roads uh, in the Gambia where we operate, because, you know, if you're distributing vaccines, you need a freezer. And if there's no electricity in the village to which you're going, it doesn't matter very much that you brought the vaccines there. And I think that was also some of the logic behind Power Africa when uh, the Center for Global Development did a survey of African leaders and discovered that the single thing that they wanted uh, the most was actually electricity. Uh, so this is a really important topic and I'm very pleased that um, uh, Professor Henry can uh, speak to us about the research he's done in this area. So uh, Peter, please take it away. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. It's a real uh, pleasure and a privilege to be back at CDDRL. Um, as you mentioned, our, <clears throat> our past sort of, you know, kind of uh, didn't quite cross in 2010. So it's it's a delight to be with you today and be with all your colleagues, and particularly, you know, given uh, given the work that's going on at CDDRL around infrastructure very broadly, and also specifically around uh, the Belt and Road Initiative work that you're doing. So let me start by saying that this work is joint work with Camille Gardner. Uh, Camille Gardner is a PhD student, <clears throat> a first year PhD student in economics at Brown University. And uh, she was a fellow, a, she's a, a graduated fellow from a, a little program that I run called the PhD Excellence Initiative. The PhD Excellence Initiative is a uh, Sloan Foundation funded program uh, whose goal it is to get more underrepresented minorities uh, into PhD programs in economics. So I would just mention that uh, this is joint work with Camille, Camille Gardner. Okay, so this paper, <clears throat> is motivated by a couple of facts. And I think Frank uh, teed it up really well by talking about the importance of roads and electricity. Uh, and in particular, uh, more specifically, the absence of roads and electricity in many uh, poor countries. So the first fact is that in poor countries, uh, and by poor countries, I'm going to be referring to those countries that the IMF has designated emerging and developing economies. So that, that's what EMDE stands for, emerging and developing economies. In poor countries, 1.2 billion people have no electricity and another billion people live more than two kilometers from an all weather road. Okay, so these are well-known facts, most recently 
documented in a, um, <clears throat> a major publication on infrastructure by, um, by Rosenberg and Fay at the World Bank. So that's fact number one, is just this essential shortage of infrastructure services in poor countries. Fact number two <clears throat> is that in April 2015, the World Bank claimed that by moving from billions to trillions in infrastructure investment in poor countries, that rich country private capital could accomplish three things. Number one, uh, close the infrastructure services gap. Uh, number two, help to achieve the sustainable development goals. And number three, make money. And so this paper really is about whether in fact this claim, this threefold claim by the World Bank uh, is actually true. In other words, is it possible for private capital to close the infrastructure services gap, help achieve the sustainable development goals and make money through all three of those things? Okay, so that's, that's the question that, uh, <clears throat> that uh, motivates this paper and the question really flows from, from those two facts. So, as I said, the question is, is it really true that poor countries, these EMDs, have widespread potential for publicly efficient and privately profitable investment in infrastructure? And so let's just take that, <clears throat> uh, that question and, and just look at both halves of, halves of it. The publicly efficient part is really about this question about achieving the sustainable development goals and providing greater infrastructure services. In other words, <clears throat> infrastructure is in general a public good. That's in, in, in most countries in the world, largely provided by uh, local, state, or federal governments. Uh, and it's provided by, uh, by governments because it's considered to be publicly efficient <clears throat> to provide infrastructure services. Okay? And so, but the question is whether uh, it is also privately profitable to provide infrastructure investment, because that's really the World Bank's claim is that to go back to the previous slide, we can achieve the publicly efficient part, i.e. close the infrastructure services gap and achieve the sustainable development goals. That's, those are the, the public parts of it. And the third part, making money, <clears throat> is about whether in fact infrastructure investment is privately profitable. So we wanna ask this question, is it both publicly, efficient and privately profitable to invest in infrastructure in a wide range of poor countries as uh, the World Bank claimed in its 2015 communique that it issued. So <clears throat> before delving into uh, ask, answering, answering that question, it's useful just to, to note a few things. Uh, number one, uh, following the World Bank's communique that was issued in 2015, uh, the McKinsey Global Institute, not to be, uh, not to be topped by the World Bank, uh, was quick to publish a report, a report that claimed that the world had a trillion dollar annual uh, infrastructure investment gap, right? And so McKinsey basically claimed that the world needed, quote unquote needed, and we'll explore what that word needed means uh, shortly, uh, another three, to, to, the world needed to invest $3.3 trillion annually uh, just to meet uh, forecasted growth. Uh, and that the world was only investing 2.5 trillion annually. And so that 800, <clears throat> um, that 800 billion uh, gap, uh, approximately a trillion, is what McKinsey, the McKinsey Global Institute refers to as the global infrastructure gap. And you'll often hear people talk about <clears throat> the trillion dollar infrastructure investment gap. And this is the gap to which they're referring. So you've got the McKinsey Global Institute, a uh, consulting firm uh, pushing this idea of a global infrastructure investment gap. And then shortly after that, in January of 2020, just before the pandemic hit, JP Morgan launched its development finance institution, which was aimed at, as the quote uh, here says, uh, helping to achieve the sustainable development goals um, by, again, bridging this annual investment gap uh, by galvanizing private capital to invest uh, uh, in this annual investment gap in infrastructure 
in developing countries. So you have the World Bank, the McKinsey Global Institute, JP Morgan, uh, the, the financial sector more generally, uh, the private sector, uh, the multilateral banks, and then not to be outdone, <clears throat> um, this is a, a slide that I took from, um, I borrowed with permission from a presentation that I attended uh, virtually uh, in December of 2020 um, at the US uh, Treasury, the Department for International Affairs, again, focusing on this issue of there being a global infrastructure gap. So you've got the World Bank, the private sector, the US Treasury, a number of significant uh, stakeholders uh, really focused on the infrastructure, this idea of an infrastructure investment gap. And here you have the, the Treasury emphasizing, emphasizing that there's a double, a triple digit need for private sector investment um, in infrastructure in poor countries. Okay. And so the first point that I want to make in, uh, in this paper is that all of these approaches that focus on this idea of an infrastructure, a global infrastructure gap and needed investment investment are failing to embrace uh, you know, what in economics we refer to as positive equilibrium analysis. In other words, the normative notions of a global infrastructure gap, the idea that there's a, a certain amount of needed investment, you know, bears an unfortunate similarity to a previous idea of a financing gap that was first, um, first brought into kind of um, uh, a conscious uh, kind of conversation in economics by Roy Harrod and F.Z. Domar uh, in the late 30s and, and mid 1940s. So the Harrod Domar model, like the MGI conception, asserted uh, that a desired level of growth requires a target level of investment. Okay, so let's say your country has a, has a target level of growth, um, then given its national savings, or scheduled investment in the case of the McKinsey Global Institute, the amount of investment that's planned to take place, the amount of investment implies a financing gap that's equal to the difference between the quantity of savings that a country has and the quantity of investment that it needs, quote unquote, to achieve uh, a desired rate of growth. And what we know from the work of Bill Easterly uh, in particular, that armed with this framework, rich countries sought to help poor countries grow by filling the gap, okay? And the rich countries failed to help uh, poor countries grow because they didn't ask the question of whether filling the gap with quote unquote needed investment would actually correct some market failure, incentivize production, and therefore endogenously raise incomes as a result of people responding to um, market signals, i.e. the rate of return on infrastructure uh, and the profitability of actually <clears throat> investing in infrastructure and the benefits that would flow to, to private investors and private producers and, and suppliers of goods and services as a result of, of, of filling the gap. So one of the important questions to ask is given all of the emphasis on uh, this idea of needed investment and there being a global infrastructure gap is whether we're in danger of experiencing uh, what Yogi Berra would have called uh, deja vu all over again. Okay, so there are a number of papers out there um, that suggest that this may in fact uh, be the case. So what I've, what, I, what I've shown here is a graph of um, the growth rate of investment in infrastructure, uh, which is really uh, investment in, 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 uh, in, in, in public capital in, uh, <clears throat> in developing emerging and developing economies and uh, the growth rate of productivity in the same set of countries. And so the green line uh, the green line here is the growth rate of productivity. And the blue line 
is the growth rate of investment in infrastructure in emerging and developing economies. So what do we see when we look at this picture? We see very clearly a ramp up, a sharp increase in the blue line uh, in the growth rate of investment, of the growth rate of infrastructure in developing economies starting in uh, the early 1970s. And that largely coincides with the lending boom that took place in emerging and developing economies um, uh, during, during the 70s. But what we also notice is that this, this, this sharp increase in infrastructure uh, uh, was accompanied not by actually an increase in productivity, but a decline in productivity in emerging and developing economies. So the first point just to note is that this sharp increase in infrastructure investment in emerging and developing economies that took place in the 1970s that was largely financed um, <clears throat> by, uh, by lending from commercial banks in rich countries uh, to governments in poor countries did not result in an increase in productivity growth. In fact, we see the opposite. We see a decline in, pro decline in productivity growth uh, throughout the period. And you might argue that infrastructure might take some time to actually result in increase, increases in productivity, um, but you don't see an increase in productivity in the developing world uh, until kind of the mid 1990s. And it sort of stretches the imagination really beyond kind of credibility to make the case that there was a two decade lag between infrastructure investment in the 1970s <clears throat> and productivity growth in the early 1990s in emerging and developing economies. And it's a, a much more credible case can be made as people like Ken Rogoff and Bill Easterly <clears throat> uh, and others have made that it was the increase uh, in lending which took place to finance many public uh, works projects in developing countries that actually led to the third world debt crisis of the 1980s. In other words, <clears throat> There was a lot of inefficient investment that took place. And the concern, frankly, is that we may be seeing um, this cycle repeating itself. Um, <clears throat> Frank mentioned the work that's going on at CDDRL around infrastructure and the Belt and Road Initiative in particular. And even before the global pandemic hit, <clears throat> folks like Signe uh, at, at Brookings and others had, and, 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 the, and the IMF had written about the dangers of overlending to Africa, right? Uh, in particular, um, you know, we've seen as a result of um, a number of loans uh, that have gone uh, to African countries through the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, rising financial distress and inability to actually sustain uh, payments on those loans because of frankly, investment uh, in infrastructure that has not, um, <clears throat> does not seem to be generating efficiency gains in terms of higher productivity, um, and higher, higher, higher GDP growth. So there's a real question as to whether we're seeing potentially deja vu all over again, and just the, 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 the potential for another uh, set of debt crises coming out of, um, investments or loans being made to invest in infrastructure that, uh, that may not actually lead to uh, sustainable high growth, high return projects is potentially uh, very, very, very alarming. And we're already seeing some evidence to suggest that that may be the case. And so <clears throat> for that reason, in this paper, we asked the question, how can we assess the extent to which there really is the potential for profitable investment in infrastructure in developing countries. In other words, investment in infrastructure in developing countries that will generate economic growth above and beyond the cost of the financing of that infrastructure. Okay? So that's really the, that's really the question we're gonna ask in this paper. <clears throat> and the question, uh, in order to sort of get at this question, it's important to sort of step back for a second because most analyses that take place in economics of capital flows between rich and poor countries just focus on one type of capital, 
right? They just focus on the, you know, they sort of think about capital as one big lump, which is we, we typically would denote K. And we say that, well, rich countries have a lot more capital than poor countries. In other words, rich countries have an abundance of capital, poor countries are, are scarce when it comes to capital. And because of that, the return on capital in rich countries is higher than the return on capital in poor countries. And therefore we'd expect capital to flow from rich countries to poor countries. Um, <clears throat> and that will generate uh, significant um, economic slash welfare gains. But in order to think about infrastructure, it's not sufficient to think about capital in a, monolith in a monolithic way, right? Because we have to make the distinction between private capital and public capital, right? So private capital meaning, for instance, uh, flows of capital from rich countries to the stock market of poor countries would be an example of private capital flows. But here we're talking, and when we think about infrastructure, we have to think about, is it the case that um, the returns on public capital, i.e. the idea of investing in a road <laughs> in say Kenya or Indonesia will have a higher rate of return than, um, than the rate of return on capital, uh, on private capital in rich countries. <clears throat> so I won't, go in, I won't go through in great detail this diagram, which I talk about in the paper, but the basic idea um, and motivation for making this distinction between private capital and public capital is that the picture gets a lot more complex because there are many, as this diagram shows, there are many different channels through which capital could, could flow from rich countries to poor countries, <laughs> and also from poor countries to rich countries. And so the key question is going to be, I'll just point out the key question, is whether the return on public capital in poor countries, which is denoted our public poor in this box in the lower left-hand corner, <laughs> is greater than the return on private capital in rich countries, right? So the key question is gonna be, is it the case that our public poor is greater than our private rich? And the reason why that's gonna be the case, so when, just to think about that, the, the question that, that, that is really being considered here is whether the return on, let's say, the S&P 500 uh, in the United States or similar uh, asset classes in rich countries, is that outstripped by the potential return on infrastructure, i.e. public capital in poor countries? If so, if our public poor is greater than our private rich, then there's going to be an incentive for private capital to flow from rich countries into the public sector of poor countries to invest in capital there. Okay, And I say potential um, because uh, just because the, the rate of return in, in and public capital and infrastructure in poor countries is higher than private capital in rich countries will not be sufficient. It's gonna be a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition in order for capital to flow from rich countries to poor countries. So let me, um, let me talk a little bit more about <clears throat> how we think about equilibrium in a world in which we've got private capital flows and public capital flows flowing from rich countries uh, to, to poor countries. Okay, so this, this diagram uh, takes a little bit of explaining. So let me, uh, let me take a minute to, to do that. <clears throat> so the question, again, the question we're trying to ask is, is it the case that poor countries contain both publicly efficient infrastructure investments as well as infrastructure investments that rich countries will find, that private capital in rich countries will find it profitable to invest in. Okay, so how do we think about that? Well, let me first um, point you to the x-axis of this graph. Right, so the x-axis of this graph asks the, the following question. When is it efficient for a poor country, a given poor country, let's say Indonesia, when is it efficient for Indonesia to invest in roads or electricity, okay, infrastructure. Well, let's denote the return on infrastructure in Indonesia by Rx. So X is infrastructure. 
and R is the return on infrastructure. Well, if the return on infrastructure in Indonesia, if the return on electricity is higher than the return on private capital in Indonesia, then it's efficient for the government in Indonesia to reallocate some of Indonesia's savings, private savings, away from the private sector to invest in, in electricity. In other words, if the, if, the, if the rate of return Rx on electricity in, in Indonesia is 30%, and the return on, cap, on private capital in Indonesia, Rk, is 15%, right? Then it'll be efficient to allocate uh, some of Indonesia's private savings away from private capital towards infrastructure because, because the, 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 the rate of return on infrastructure is higher than the rate of return on private capital, okay? And so what this, what this x-axis shows then is this dashed line on the x-axis, uh, which is running vertically here, right? Whenever it's the case that Rx is greater than Rk, right? In other words, we lie to the right of this dashed line for countries that are in that category, okay, have, where, that category being having a rate of return on infrastructure that's higher than the rate of return on private capital, it will be efficient for those countries uh, to invest uh, in, infra in infrastructure domestically, okay? So that's the case for, for everything that lies to the right of the dashed line, okay? So this, so, this, so this vertical dashed line in some sense represents a hurdle rate for efficient investment in infrastructure within the country domestically. Now we can ask the same, we can ask another, another question about Indonesia and ask the question, when will it be efficient? When, when will it be profitable for rich countries to invest in infrastructure in Indonesia? I, when will it be efficient for uh, or profitable for capital to flow from the private sector in the United States into in infrastructure in, in, in Indonesia? And that's the question that's considered um, on the y-axis. So on the y-axis, we consider the rate of return on infrastructure again in Indonesia, so Rx, okay, that's just the, uh, the rate of return on electricity in Indonesia. And on the, and in the denominator, oops, excuse me, we have Rk star, RK star is just the rate of return on capital. Let's, let's say the S&P 500 in the United States. So if the rate of return on, electri on electricity in Indonesia, let's say 30% is higher than the rate of return on the S&P 500 in the US, let's say it's 7%, then there'll be an incentive, right? For capital to flow from the US into Indonesia to invest in infrastructure. And that threshold is represented by this horizontal dashed line. Okay, so the horizontal dashed line uh, is, is the set of all points for which uh, the rate of return on infrastructure in the, develop, in the poor country is equal to the rate of return on infrastructure in the rich country. And so for all points of, that align above this horizontal dashed line, it's going to be pr profitable for capital to flow from the rich country into infrastructure in the poor country. And so why is this why is this why is this important? Well, the the intersection of these two dashed lines breaks the world into four quadrants, right? And I want you to focus on the upper right hand quadrant here. The upper right hand quadrant uh, consists of those countries for which the rate of return on infrastructure. Uh, relative to the rate of return of private capital in that country, Indonesia, is such that it's if publicly efficient for Indonesia to invest in infrastructure. And it's also the case that it's gonna be profitable for uh, rich country private capital to, um, to, uh, to flow to, the, to that country, in this case, Indonesia. So this upper right-hand quadrant is in some sense the sweet spot 
the, 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 the intersection uh, point uh, that the World Bank uh, is touting exists in many countries, okay? In other words, if a country lands in the upper right-hand quadrant, uh, it's both efficient, publicly efficient and, and, and privately profitable to invest in infrastructure in that country. Um, and it's not the case if, it, if the country lands in quadrant two, three, or four. Um, so I won't say much about quadrants two, three, or four at the moment. Um, the most important thing to understand from this picture is that we can divide the world into these four quadrants um, and only quadrant one, this upper right-hand quadrant, quadrant um, is a quadrant where it's both efficient and profitable uh, for infrastructure investment in uh, a given country. Okay, and so this is sort of this is sort of what the equilibrium approach drives us to. Okay, and what I'm going to do with the rest of my uh, my my time here is just tell you what the data say. Okay, in other words, how many countries fall into the upper right hand quadrant? Right, that's really what what that's really what this paper is about. So the, the, there are data to, to, to do this uh, and the data <clears throat> uh, to do this, uh, they're, they're come from a, a, a paper that was commissioned by the World Bank in 2000. Uh, and very important to understand the data, the, the, the paper the World Bank commissioned in 2000 was actually based on a 1985 data. So the rates of return that I'm talking about in this paper are social rates of return on, uh, on, on electricity generating capacity and the social rate of return on paved roads. So you can think about the social rate of return, the Rx that I referred to in the, in the, in the previous graph as being the incremental, the return on GDP, sort of the, the, the amount of, a 20% return would mean uh, a you know a dollar of GDP of GDP invested in roads would generate an additional dollar and twenty cents of GDP, right? So it's, that's what we mean by a social social rate of return on 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 investment. And so the the data that um, <clears throat> that Canning and Nathan used to calculate social rates of return um, were based on fifty three poor countries. And they also had data on 16 rich countries with which to calculate social rates of return on both roads and electricity. And just to tell you a little, about, a little bit about the data, there are 26 poor countries that had data on roads, 49 on, on electricity. <laughs> so there were a total of 75, if you will, country infrastructure return observations that we could, uh, that are, you can use to actually uh, subject to this, uh, this kind of dual hurdle framework that I showed you in the, in, the previous, uh, in the previous graph. But very importantly, the data on which they were able to do their return calculations is from 1985. And so I wanna point out to you, you know, the World Bank commissioned work on the social rate of return on infrastructure in poor countries that was 30 years old at the time the World Bank issued its communique in 2015. So in other words, when the World Bank issued its communique in 2015, making this claim that there were widespread opportunities for profitable investment in poor countries that was also publicly efficient, um, there was no data since 1985 on which, to base this, on which to base this claim. And that's a very important fact that I want you just to keep in mind. So what do we see? When we actually look at the data, look at the returns um, that were calculated by Canning and Benathan in their 2000 paper that was commissioned by the World Bank based on 1985 data, okay, we find that um, of the 75 observations, okay, the 75 observations of roads and electricity across 53 countries only 39 of the 75 observations across a total of 32 countries sorted into quadrant one, right? In other words, we take the universe of data on the rate of return on roads and electricity that was extant in 1985, okay? For all the data we have on which we could actually evaluate the World Bank's claim that there are widespread opportunities for efficient 
publicly efficient, privately profitable investment. Only 39 of 75 countries, 39 of 75 country return observations fall into quadrant one. Okay. So in other words, um, the, the availability or the prevalence of profitable and efficient infrastructure uh, opportunities is not nearly so large as uh, one might think based on, on the World Bank communique. So just to give you a sense of order of magnitude, I mean, basically how, how big are the return um, uh, possibilities? Well, of the 39 quadrant one opportunities, okay, so of the 39 infrastructure return observations that fell into quadrant one, okay, 21 were in roads and 18 were in electricity. For the 21 opportunities in roads, okay, the, uh, the mean return on roads was 10.2 lar times larger than the mean return, than the return on rich country private capital. So that's a huge difference, 10.2 times as large, okay? Um, where the baseline uh, for the return on rich country private capital is basically taken to be uh, return on, uh, expected return on the stock market in rich countries. Uh, in the case of electricity, the, the mean return was much more modest, about 2.2 times uh, the return on rich country private capital. I want to, what I want to do now is give you a sense of just, you know, how, how, how do we think about, you know, 10.2 versus 2.2, how big, you know, is big, right? Um, but before doing that, uh, let me just uh, say something about, um, uh, a little bit more about prevalence. So the World Bank has this 2015 uh, communique, which it claims that there are these privately, publicly efficient, privately profitable investment opportunities in infrastructure. But the 21 out of 53 countries for which we had data in 1985 did not clear the dual hurdle for either roads or electricity. So in other words, 21 of the 53 countries for which there were data to evaluate the World Bank's claim did not have privately profitable or publicly and publicly efficient investment opportunities. Right, so roughly, you know, roughly two fifths of the countries for which we have data just did not have uh, infrastructure investment opportunities that 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 um, were both privately profitable and publicly efficient. And of the 32 countries with projects that cleared the dual hurdles, um, only seven countries fell into quadrant one for both roads and electricity. Right, so in other words, in spite of the fact that there are 1.2 billion people, you know, without access to roads and electricity, in only seven of the 32 countries, is it privately profitable and publicly efficient to invest in both roads and electricity? So that's a pretty small number out of starting from 53 countries. So the reality that less than one seventh of the countries in 1985 presented a data-driven case for efficient and profitable investment raises real questions about the wisdom of the billions to trillions um, campaign of the World Bank. And it's true, the data on which um, I'm basing this study and are old, they're based on 1985 data, things could have changed 30 years later. But the point is the World Bank did not bother to redo the data before issuing its communique. Right, so the only basis on which you could actually make any evaluation in a systematic way is in fact these, are, these old data. And based on these old data, there, it just doesn't, there just isn't, there isn't evidence to make the case that, the, that there are widespread opportunities. Now, where the opportunities do exist, they're actually quite large, right? So let me go back to this, uh, where I told you that the, the average return on roads was 10.2 times larger than the return on rich country private capital. Where is that, where is that coming from? Uh, well, <clears throat> the way to think about that comparison is that in 1985, at that point in time, rich citizens in rich countries were not allowed to invest in the stock market of poor countries. 
Okay, so you were, you, were, you were legally prohibited if you were a US investor from, let's say, investing in you know, Mexican or Brazilian stocks, okay? And so if you looked at the expected return on US stocks in 1985 versus the expected return on emerging market stocks in 1985, okay? Uh, the, 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 the return differential uh, was about 1.7. In other words, the expected return on emerging market stocks in 1985 was about 1.7 times as large as the expected return on the S&P 500, okay? So the 10, the, the, the 10 uh, um number that I'm giving you here um, tells you for, for return on infrastructure means that the mean return on infrastructure in developing countries uh, in roads in 1985 was uh, 10.2 times larger than the return on rich country private capital. All right, so that's um, <clears throat> so much, much, so, so 10.2 versus 1.7, okay? Uh, the, the excess return in infrastructure was about 10.2, excess return in stocks uh, was 1.7. So in other words, the excess return that existed on poor country infrastructure in 1985 um, in those quadrant one countries was roughly sevenfold the excess return multiple that existed on developing country portfolio equity at the time. And, and the reason why that's an important comparison is if you think about it, after 1985, starting in roughly 1989, when poor countries opened their stock markets to foreign investors, the 1.7 fold excess return on poor country uh, portfolio equity was enough to, to basically create or lead to incentivize the creation of a whole new industry, essentially called emerging market equity funds. And so if the return on infrastructure in certain poor countries is seven times larger than the excess return that was sufficient to generate and lead to the creation of the emerging market equity fund industry, that suggests that where those excess returns do exist in infrastructure in poor countries, in particularly in roads, they can be actually very, very large indeed. Okay, so bottom line, uh, the infrastructure opportunities uh, in poor countries are not nearly as prevalent as the World Bank's um, uh, billions to trillions campaign and communicate would have you believe. But where they do exist, uh, the returns are actually we're actually quite large. Now, too much has happened since 1985 to draw to draw any 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 any. You know, definitive distinctions based on, on information from that year. But what we think the, the, the contribution of this paper is by conducting a new analysis of old data, we're A, providing a template that can be readily applied to updated cross-country data on the social return on infrastructure. And in particular, we think the paper really demonstrates the urgency of the World Bank collecting and disseminating that data as soon as possible. In other words, this dual hurdle framework that we've applied to data from 1985, ideally the World Bank would have applied this framework to the data in 2015 before issuing a communique. Uh, that's not what happened um, and that's unfortunate, but we think these, this, this, this line of research has the opportunity to, um, to be helpful in that regard. So uh, why don't I pause there, Frank, and um, open it up okay. to questions. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Peter. So uh, we will open it up to questions. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We've already got uh, a couple in the queue, but while we're um, letting people do that, Peter, I would like to lead off by asking you a couple of things. Uh, so it seems to me that when you talk about social rates of return, these are notoriously difficult to measure. Yes, uh, and there's always a bias towards optimism because if you want to push ahead with a project, you always have a big fudge factor. 
and they're also very complex because it's not just the increment. I mean, you're talking about both positive and negative externalities. And so you, right. you may get a higher increment of growth, but you may also destroy a habitat. You may, you know, create devastation, social devastation, pollution, you know, all of these sorts of things. And, um, and so the, the social rate of return is a very fudgeable uh, number. And whether private capital actually flows really depends on whether the private uh, returns are, you know, how, what, what their relative sizes uh, to the social returns, because a private investor can, can only make money off of the internal rate of return, but the externalities, uh, you know, go to the society in which the investment is being made. Maybe the government can get some of that back in terms of higher taxes, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, they just want the growth and, you know, they're willing to put, to put money into that. So in this World Bank analysis, what is the mix of, of, of uh, private versus social returns when, for example, when you say it's 10 times more for roads, how does that break down with regard to social returns versus you know, internal rates of return uh, that a private investor would look at? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question, Frank. And it's, um, <clears throat> it's a, it's a, a, it, that issue is at the heart <laughs> of uh, what matters here. So one of the things that we, we spent some time talking about the, in the paper is your point about, a, what we call it a pro, appropriability. Because to your point, point, Frank, the question is you may have, let's say, you know, a, a social rate of return on GDP that's 140%. But if the private investor, uh, you know, DD can only appropriate, you know, uh, 20%, and then she's got to make a, uh, a determination. If I can appropriate 20%, and on a risk-adjusted basis, the 20% isn't may not be high enough to compensate me for the risk of investing in that country. And so the key point about the analysis that we're doing, and we try to be very careful about, about not overstating what we're, what we're saying here, is it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. To your point, having a, having a social rate of return that exceed, and if the social rate of return in the, in the poor country exceeding the private rate of return in the rich country is a necessary but not sufficient condition for private capital to flow. It's precisely for the reasons you say, because as, you, as, you, because as we think about, okay, can you actually appropriate enough, private, enough of a private rate of return to actually get rich country investors to do this, um, you can run into real challenges. Uh, you know, we have an example in the paper of uh, kind of investments in water in Bolivia, where there was a privatization scheme that was that was put in place, and uh, it worked out okay for ten years. But then, when the when the when the private company tried to raise, <laughs> excuse me, tried to raise um, <clears throat> the prices that were being charged to 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 uh, local consumers of water, there was a massive protest, and right. the Just government was basically forced. Off. Yes. Yeah, yeah right. I know that case well. So you, right. so you know I mean, you know that case. And so and so these so but our point is once you, when when you especially when you take into consideration appropriability and the fact that these are just necessary conditions, not sufficient ones, it underscores the point that the World Bank really has over is is has not has, has not been sufficiently careful in helping us think about where these returns really may be feasible or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because to your point, the numbers that we're showing here may be overstating the case in which you could actually uh, uh, have uh, uh, appropriability. Mm -hmm. But if it, but if, but if, they're, if if they're overstating the case for appropriability, and we're still finding that these opportunities are fairly rare, then they may be even more rare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's a question in the chat as to whether uh, people can get a copy of this paper. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, I'd be happy to. I will. I will email a copy of the paper to uh, the colleagues at CDR. CDR. Can they can they access okay. from the CDR website? Yeah, I think we can. We can post it on our website and then uh, make it available to people that want to download it. Yeah, I'd be. I'd be delighted to do that. I would welcome. Uh, any and all comments.
Okay. Uh, so there's another question about uh, how your analysis would apply to China because China has become by far the single biggest uh, infrastructure investor for the developing world as a whole. Uh, and they're looking at very similar kinds of considerations in you know, their capital flows. Um, do you think they go through a similar analysis to what the World Bank has done or do you think their rates of return you know, on these different uh, 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 types of investments are, are different? Um, it's, an it's an excellent question. <clears throat> so I would say two things. I think first on, on, on the World Bank, um, I would say the World Bank, whether it's our framework or some other framework should have some framework like this that is really asking the hard question about um, whether or not there are, there's, there's a case to be made for sustainable investment in infrastructure. Because to your point, Frank, if, if the social returns aren't higher than, the, than the, the, the required private rates of return, then the countries are going to eventually run into debt servicing problems. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, my, my, my gut, and I'm not an expert in China, but my gut tells me that, uh, if you will, kind of the objective function of uh, the Chinese officials that are driving the allocation of capital around the world, um, there may be some element of rates of return in these poor countries where they're allocating capital in that objective function, but I don't think that's the primary objective, mm -hmm. is my sense. Mm -hmm. And how do, what do I say that? I say that based on the observation, if that were the case, we would, I, I'm not sure we'd be, we'd be seeing as many African countries in particular falling into financial distress. And, and so the bigger point, which I <clears throat> want to make here, is that we think about the entire kind of post-World War II Bretton Woods financial system, right? Mm -hmm. It's usually you've written, written about and thought a lot about yourself, right? <laughs> right? The objective, one, at least one of the objectives of that system on which both the World Bank, the IMF were based, right, was the idea we wanted to map maximize global growth mm -hmm. given some other constraints we want it we want we want capital to be allocated around the world in such a way that we're equalizing returns so that so that that, that poor countries are growing more rapidly and rich countries can also benefit from that rapid growth um, but in the absence of institutions like the world bank and the imf driving thinking about investing in infrastructure that's based on rates of return, we're not gonna see that. Mm -hmm. And so my biggest, one of, my, one of the biggest concerns and, 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 and motivations for writing the paper was because the US has frankly sort of, you know, stepped back and abdicated its role, you know, the US was absent from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, the US, um, for a long time, you know, refused to actually increase the, the quotas and voting shares in the IMF, the World Bank. Right. And so we saw as a result of that, the rise of the BRICS and alternative institutions that were taking a view of the global allocation of capital that was not necessarily motivated by, you know, growth maximizing objectives. And I, so I think we're seeing the consequences of that. And so a major, major motivation for writing these papers to say, hey, if we really want to maximize global growth, then we've actually got to think about rates of return. And it's not obvious that the most important, one of the most important allocators of capital towards infrastructure right now, uh, China, is actually being uh, being driven by, by such considerations. Yeah, so this is obviously uh, a topic we, we can talk about a lot uh, further. Mike Bennett and I wrote a paper about three years ago uh, trying to you know in, interpret what the Chinese decision-making structure was because uh, there's quite a lot of their projects that don't make any sense in terms of either uh, social or private rates of return and yet they you know they did it which makes you think that there's a foreign policy or strategic uh, you know concern that uh, is driving it and even in cases where there's not an obvious strategic motive I do think that they've got an over optimistic understanding of the social rates of return uh, which from their standpoint is a little bit odd because they can't capture, you know, Pakistan grows faster because of a Belt and Road project 
they can't get the benefits of that faster growth except very, very, you know, tangentially. Right. Um, but because of that overestimation, they've saddled a lot of countries with, uh, you know, with some incredible debt. We actually just wrote this case on this little highway in Montenegro uh, that, you know, this one project raised their debt to GDP ratio from 60 to like 67%. Wow. And one project, <laughs> one project. Uh, and it was like a 43 kilometer section of a road. It wasn't even a complete road. Uh, and they're now at over 100 uh, uh, percent uh, debt to GDP. And they've now gone hat in hand to the EU to wow. be bailed out. And then the EU faces this question of, do we uh, bail out a uh, a project, a Chinese project that at the time was regarded as completely irresponsible, uh, right. but nonetheless, the country got into trouble. And I actually think well, for political see, reasons, I think we can do that, but it's, it's, you know, it's a big problem. Well, I'd love to see both of those papers you mentioned, if you'd send them to me. I'd really like to read them. Yeah, sure. Uh, so another question is actually, uh, what are the political motives of the World Bank that might stand behind their, you know, issuing the, the kind of assertion that you uh, have been criticizing? Uh, is there some, you know, politics behind that? Yeah, I think the Paul is so you, you want one has to <clears throat> has to um, infer that people that that uh, World Bank employees are, are, reward, are rewarded for making the loans, <laughs> mm -hmm. as opposed to necessarily um, you know, uh, generating growth. And if you're evaluated by um, by how much you lend versus whether the, uh, you know, the, these projects actually uh, deliver results in the end and you can get you can get skewed incentives. And so that's, that's sort of my, that's sort of my first conclusion, but also, but, 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 a, but a less flip answer to that. Uh, very seriously, you know, it wouldn't. It would not be. It would not. It would, there would be no additional cost for, you know, the Biden Treasury to sit down with uh, the president of the World Bank and say, "Listen, <laughs> uh, the biggest opportunity for uh, the U.S. globally, and it, the U.S. the biggest the biggest U.S. infrastructure opportunity, is not to rebuild roads and bridges in the United States. It's actually to." To get the World Bank to produce the data, to drive a data-driven agenda around global infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, and so, I, so <clears throat> the World Bank could play a major role by essentially incentivizing its its key managers uh, to um, to do the right thing by producing the data and then rewarding them based on the basis of uh, um, whether these loans are sustainable. As opposed to just rewarding on the basis of how many loans, uh, quantity mm -hmm. of loans that they make. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, there's another question that I don't quite understand, but uh, is there uh, a way to model global growth um, uh, in a way that I, I suppose more holistically thinks about? You know the world as a whole and its public uh, infrastructure needs, um, rather than simply doing this on a kind of project by project uh, basis. And I suppose this would get into a question like, uh, you know, global redistribution, uh, where mm -hmm. actually you may deliberately, as a public, you know, quasi-public or a public body like the World Bank, you know, may say, you know, we're actually not just interested in you know, in returns per project, we actually want to, you know, uh, promote, you know, global well-being as a whole. Yes. Yes. So it's a good, qu a good question. I, 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 I went past it fairly quickly when I was presenting the slides, but in that there's a slide that I put up where it showed the um, kind of that complicated slide with the, the various kinds of capital flows. When you, once you think about capital as public capital and private capital, and the very important point about <clears throat> thinking about capital flow is not just as one type of capital, but public and private capital, is that the, the recent research basically shows, and this is why we care about infrastructure, recent research basically shows that the, the 
untapped welfare gains, to your point, Frank, mm -hmm. about global redistribution, the untapped welfare gains from bringing about, from equalizing the differentials between the rate of return on public capital across the world are, are much, much larger than the potential benefits from um, uh, equalizing any remaining differences between the rate of return on private capital. Mm -hmm. In other words, what do we know? So we know that what basically when the world, so in, in the late 1980s and early 1990s, the world largely began, the developing world largely began to lift restrictions on private capital flows. And not surprisingly to some extent, given what, we, given the, what, what are in our textbooks, the rate of, rates of return on private capital largely on a risk adjusted basis largely equalized around the world. Which means to your, your point and the, and the questioner's point, there aren't a lot, there's, there aren't a lot of gains still to be had um, because of uh, untapped private capital flows between yeah. rich and poor countries. Mm -hmm. but, but, we haven't, but we've not figured out this infrastructure problem. And so basically, basically the private capital, the, the public capital, the, the gains from public capital flows, public returns being equalized are about 4.8 or five times as large as mm -hmm. the untapped gains from, um, from private capital flows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, there's, 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 there's large scope here, but it's tricky. It's tricky mm -hmm. for the reasons of appropriability that you mentioned. Um, and it's tricky because um, there are lots of there are places in the world where, the, where there are big differentials between private uh, capital in rich countries and, and, and public capital in poor countries, um, but the mechanisms that need to be in place in order to make those returns sustainable and mm -hmm. appropriate uh, require a lot of thought, and they're also and 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 they're not as many of those opportunities at least based on the old data that we have that the World Bank has mm -hmm. made it has made made it seem, and so in order to 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 get this right, we need better. We need we need updated data, and re, to your point, realistic estimates, right? That can, mm -hmm. that are provided in a, a publicly vetted place, because mm -hmm. of, to sort of get around these fudge factors. Because as you said, you, anybody who wants to make the case can sort of fudge the internal, you know, the the the, the yeah. social rates of return, right? Yeah. And so you want to have an international body, you know essentially put out audited social rates of return that everyone can kind of agree on, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that would be a, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, it would also be great to get some Chinese estimates of social rates of return. Yes. <laughs> there. So there's a, there's a question about uh, why the World Bank is not being careful with regard to environment and projects. Uh, because that's largely unregulated. Uh, I'm gonna actually change that question because I think that it begins from an incorrect factual uh, assumption. I, I, in fact, I think the truth of the matter is a little bit the opposite, that the uh, World Bank is so concerned about environmental damage uh, uh, in its safeguards regime that that's been one of the big reasons that it's been losing uh, projects to China, uh, that World Bank projects are notorious for the number of environmental reviews. And it's not just that, it's worker safety. It's, uh, you know, uh, you have to have the right dialogues with indigenous communities that are being affected by the project, you know, uh, and so forth. And so the projects take, uh, you know, an inordinate amount of time. The cost is, you know, much higher. Uh, and as a result of that, <laughs> Chinese end up, you know, um, uh, running rampant, uh, and the bank has been, you know, actually engaged in a ten-year review of its safeguards regime because it's worried about this problem. But, uh, you know, as of now, they still haven't really fixed it. But I wonder if you could say anything about the negative externality side of, you know, any of these calculations or, or modeling. Yeah. So I guess I would say that. Um... It is possible to. Um, there, there is an there is a, there is an intersection of, you know, green, sustainable in a financial sense, um, and publicly efficient. And 
<clears throat> the key is to have you know data and consistent methodology for identifying those. And the World Bank would I think would do well to to, to focus there. That doesn't address you know there's this 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 kind of um, collective action problem that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the best way to, 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 to address that collective action problem in some sense would be to have a, a realistic fact-based um, approach for actually driving forward on those intersection of projects that are both you know, green, uh, financially sustainable and publicly efficient. Mm -hmm. Because then you, would, then you would have a realistic counterweight if you will, to sort of the, the Chinese sort of uh, approach of, well, let's sort of, you know, put all the safeguards to the side and just, you know, and, and, and finance things. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another question about whether in your model you considered the distributional effects, effects on Gini coefficients of infrastructure development and not just these rates of return uh, on the yeah, no, we're, we're, not, we're, not, we're, we're not actually considering distributional effects in our, in our, in our model. Mm -hmm. Our our goal is just to provide and distributional effects are important, but we're just trying to provide a framework to bring some discipline, frankly, <laughs> to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so apparently I mangled this question uh, from Scott McLeod uh, when I tried to restate it. So let me just read it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you for this great presentation. Uh, if you were seeking. Okay, let me clarify. In laying out of roads, for example, in computer simulations with costs and returns uh, in each of the countries of the world, how would such modeling be extended to electricity systems modeling, uh, to city development modeling simulations and economics, even with people as avatars and economic questions? Uh, in doing so, could you use the data categories, for example, and from the World Bank's 1985 paper? So, so I think I think it's, I think it's an important question, <clears throat> and I think that um, what I would say, and we talk about this in the paper, the most important intersection of, of kind of the opportunity for green financially sustainable and publicly efficient is cities, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 urbaniz the urban urbanization in the developing world is the single biggest opportunity to, to, to hit the sweet spot, right? And as, as you mm -hmm. may, may, know, may know, Frank, and maybe Scott knows this as well, but for, the, for folks on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the webinar who don't, uh, UN world population estimates show that between 2000 and 2030, the population in cities in developing countries is going to double from 2 billion to 4 billion. Okay. So in other words, almost all of the, all of the net urbanization right. that's going to take place in the world in the next 15 years is going to be in emerging, in emerging and developing economies. And the reason why this is so important is because if you want to, if you want to develop, so the, what, what makes a city productive? A city is essentially a large labor market, right? And the single most important thing you can do to maximize the productivity of a city is to minimize the commute time <laughs> from home to work. Right? There's a there's a there's a there's a large body right. of, kind of urban right. literature that shows this. Or not go to work at all. Or not go to work at all. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> exactly. And so this suggests that yes, to, to answer Scott's question, thinking about the simulation of what would maximize the efficiency of commuting times uh, in these newly developed cities that are gonna be prop cropping up all over the developing world. And by the way, there's very important work that we, we cite in the paper by a professor at NYU named, um, named uh, uh, Sally Angel, Shlomo Angel, that shows that the, the way to, to best ensure um, that cities minimize their commuting times in the future is by putting down essentially um, an arterial grid of dirt roads before cities develop. In other words, just mark out the places in cities before they develop where you expect the roads to go. 
Because by doing that, you can governments can begin to plan for urban growth and basically begin buying up the land <laughs> that they need. Because mm -hmm. getting to your point, Frank, about uh, about communities getting disrupted later, right? If you mm -hmm. plan ahead and buy the land now before prices rise when cities start to develop, you can reduce the cost of actually building infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't. So that 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 argument is is developed extensively in the in the angel paper that we, we cite but to um to the point of the question though yes cities are at the center of this and thinking about ways to model future urban development in cities is going to be key to actually hitting the sweet spot of green privately sustainable and and publicly efficient financing of infrastructure Okay, uh, so in the couple of minutes we have uh, left, um, let me add another question of my own. Uh, it's interesting, you know, that you were referring to the Herod Domar growth model. Uh, it seems to me a lot of people have been trying to revive that lately. People like Jeffrey Sachs, who seem to think that it's just a matter of putting a lot of K into poor countries that's going to yep. lead them to uh, take off. Uh, and you know, it seems to me we've had a lot of experience with this since the heyday of that model uh, and that there are a lot of other missing things. Uh, and in particular, poor countries are missing not just capital and labor, K and L, but they're also missing institutions. Uh, yes. And this becomes a particular issue with regard to infrastructure because corruption, you know, is a notorious uh, uh, way of siphoning money off of you know, big infrastructure projects and has really reduced the social returns uh, uh, to many of them. Uh, and I wonder if you could speak to that or what, what is the appropriate, you know, model now that, that you know, we need to use instead of something as primitive as, as Herrick Domar? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think that um, there's a lot of evidence to, to suggest that the Herrick Domar approach um, for what it's worth has you know um been over overdone um i think that this paper shows yet another example of the need to be cautious and i think what what you know there's no question that there's a short of shortage of infrastructure in poor countries but we have to think very hard about why is there a shortage mm -hmm. In some cases, it's because there generally are uh, um, um, issues with that 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 that, that relate to imperfections in capital markets, <clears throat> and where 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 there, where there are imperfect capital markets, there may be a significant role for the World Bank and others providing the information and other things that are required to overcome those imperfections. But where the issue is deeper issues of corruption, uh, it doesn't, you know, the, the returns are gonna be low. Uh, appropriate, appropriability is gonna be low. And the important, the, mo the most important thing the World Bank can do in some respects is provide the data and information that people need to make, draw those distinctions and not undermine its credibility by making statements about the prevalence of there being high returns where there are places where there aren't, where they don't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the one reason why they may not exist is precisely the reasons you mentioned, Frank, because we're, we're, we're there are institutional issues. But we can actually, but, but the good news is we can actually, you know, where, there's, where, there, where, the, where there are poor institutions, it will show up in the rates of return because these are low growing countries, right? And, we, and, and so one of the things I didn't, get, I didn't have a chance to talk about in detail in the paper, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the, 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 the webinar, but it's in the paper, is in those quadrants two, three, and four, they're, they're, they're different typologies. And then you can, you can point out their countries that fall into, into certain quadrants because they have poor institutions. And there's just low returns and everything because they have low, low institutions. And in those, and so in, the, in, in those quadrants, there's no case for infrastructure investment. Right, right. And those are countries where, to your point, the, what, the, the, what, the, the change that really makes, needs to take place, and again, how, how it happens is, is the subject of your work, but how do you bring about institutional change? Right. But that's right. where the focus needs to be in, in some countries. Okay. 
Well, if we could answer that, we'd, <laughs> we'd be... No, everyone would be rich. <laughs> yeah, everyone would be rich. Okay, well, with that, uh, Peter, thank you very much. It was a really great and stimulating talk. Thanks to the audience uh, out there for attending. And um, we're looking forward to seeing you at our next CDDRL event, which will be uh, this Thursday. So, so long. Thank you, Frank. Thanks, everyone, for, for, yeah. for joining in.